A very good evening and welcome to this edition of the Fourth Estate, Charles Mangushampagi. And tonight, with a panel of journalists, we'll be discussing two critical issues. One is Uganda double speaking on the International Criminal Court, or is it playing a game of uh, international diplomacy, the best game of international diplomacy? Um, proposing a judge to sit on the ICC bench, but at the same time appearing to cheerlead um, African criticism of the International Criminal Court. We'll be discussing that. And also, we'll be discussing. Um, a diplomatic spat over the new chair of the African Union. Uh, Uganda apparently didn't fully support uh, Amina Hassi, the Kenyan candidate. Uh, the, Minister for, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Sam Kutesa, the other day gave a press conference on Friday. And uh, he insisted that Uganda fully supported uh, Amina Hassi. And uh, uh, though the Kenyans have been complaining and saying Uganda foxed them in some way. Let me introduce the panel that I have tonight. Starting with... Uh, long lost from the panel, Angelo Izama. Angelo, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Charles. Um, um, Ona Peter Ekomoloit, Corporate Affairs Director of Nile Breweries um, InBev, AB InBev. Good evening, Charles, and good evening, viewers. I, I, I saw Ona the other day defending um, uh, beer and uh, saying it's not <laughs> such a bad thing. I wish you a lot of your viewers out there. <laughs> <laughs> will agree with me at this hour is not <laughs> when they are watching AFCON things mm. can really happen you know? because they've been grappled <laughs> by, by, by a bylaw passed by the Gulu local government um, to ban no we actually have to with the yeah. modest regulation we don't believe in alcohol abuse we mm. believe in responsible consumption Okay. no contradiction no contradiction uh, <laughs> did, did, was that the Uganda Alcohol Association or something what was it called <laughs> <laughs> consumption of alcohol mm -hmm. is rated as some of the highest in the world. Mm -hmm. And alcohol is clinically depressant. And it's, it's not right? true. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, if people are drinking so much and alcohol is depressant, mm -hmm. what are we depressed about? Mm -hmm. What are we treating? Or mm -hmm. Well, I think it's mm -hmm. not a different purpose in Russia. Well, I, think <laughs> I, I, I really don't want to talk about my industry on this mm -hmm. show, but look, they, I think there's always confusion. There's alcohol and then there's the product we're dealing with is beer. Mm. True, people drink too much of alcohol, alcohol and not necessarily beer. Mm. Yeah, so that's but actually, the, the mm. interesting thing is that the alcohol content in beer mm. is so little. Mm. About 4.6 from a uh, majority of the beers, about 4.6. It depends on what kind of beer you drink. <laughs> 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 the Russians were producing vodka, which was 97% alcohol. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you're looking for um, uh, antidepressants, mm. that was, was a good one. Let me introduce. No, we just bring joy to society, guys. Yeah. Don't talk about Ivan that. Okuda. Okay. Ivan is uh, mm -hmm. a law student at Macquarie University, but also a journalist at the Daily Monitor. Thank you, Charles. Profoundly humbled. Good evening in Uganda. Let me start with you. Um, about three weeks ago, there was a debate in this town, uh, actually in this hotel just above there, uh, in this conference center just above, for uh, I think in Addis Hall or something, um, by a group that was discussing ICC, Africa, and the International Criminal Court. And the discussion was uh, designed primarily to be able to feed into the African Union Summit that was supposed to be, that, that took place in, uh, in Addis uh, a few days ago. The major contradiction is that, what appears to be a contradiction, I don't know if it is a contradiction or not, is that Uganda has been cheerleading the sharpest and uh, most vitriolic criticism of the International Criminal Court. But when we went to the African Union Summit, on the sidelines, and there was a statement from State House to that effect, on the sidelines of the summit, President Yoram Seven was meeting various leaders trying to lobby for a Ugandan candidate to sit on the ICC bench. Is, is that a contradiction? Is that diplomacy? What would you make of that? Just I'm fairly passionate about uh, uh, the question of uh, ICC versus Africa and Africa versus ICC, uh, partly because I'm a student of international law, but also um, as someone who has interest in uh, the governance uh, <laughs> landscape. Oh, I, I thought beautiful you continent. To say someone has interest in ICC. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, interest in the, the, the governance landscape of this uh, beautiful continent <laughs> called Africa. What you've just described is not fundamentally strange. If anything, it goes to add evidence to the fact that 
the misgivings about ICC, the knee-jerk reactions, essentially feed into um, the fears, mm -hmm. but also the discomfort that is, for all intents and purposes, convenient uh, in some parts of Africa. About 124 countries in the world are members of the ICC, uh, founded in uh, July 2002. But of course Africa continues to have, because a third of those members are, are from Africa, and Africa continues to have the biggest cry mm. uh, in respect to what they think is uh, this proportionality in respect to how the court dispenses uh, justice or conducts its business. And indeed, that is also not a, a claim that can be dismissed uh, with a wave of the hand. You have, since 2002, 36 individuals indicted, about 22 cases had, all of which are from Africa. But of course the court is also conducting investigations in, for example, Honduras, in uh, Colombia, in Iraq, they are conducting investigations in Georgia, in Georgia yes. they are conducting investigations in Afghanistan. As of 2006, they had closed investigations on uh, UK's involvement in uh, mistreatment or crimes against humanity uh, in respect to detainees in Iraq between 2003 and 2008. And Moreno Campo, then the chief prosecutor, uh, said if we find more information, we shall open the investigation. As of last year, a team of uh, lawyers, uh, calling themselves public interest lawyers, and an organization in Europe called the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights Law, mm. did write to the ICC, uh, giving more information in respect to the United Kingdom and committing atrocities it's in Iraq. the group that wants uh, Tony yes. Blair and, uh, and, and George Bush. Exactly, and, yes. and, and the ICC is, is doing investigations. Those investigations have reached what they call phase two, which in the language and uh, dictum of ICC operations means they've reached a level where they can now analyze the information and arrive at a conclusion on whether or not they can be able to get into the country and, uh, and exercise the jurisdiction. So it's, it's not an entirely uh, true assertion that the ICC is essentially a prejudice against Africa. Mm. What is actually true is that the instances where the ICC is seen to be going hard on Africa and not other parts of the world, such as America, for example, which is not even a member of the ICC, or even the UK, or even India, which is not a member of the ICC, or China, or any of the other powerhouses, is more to do with the structural challenges that accrue from, for example, uh, the composition of the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. If you look at the case of Syria, where the ICC should possibly have already worked as early as yesterday and taken action, the reason why the ICC cannot take action is essentially because of the UN Security Council mm -hmm. being a structural bottleneck to the extent that if you have so what non set the, actors. The, the question would be what mm -hmm. should African leaders be advocating for? Should they be advocating for withdrawal from the ICC? Or a, sp or a place on the UN Security Council because the, the, the example you're giving mm. of Syria, yes, because Russia, which is a friend of Syria, mm. will veto any action yes. against Syria. Yes, yes. So, so you have you have, you have the structural bottleneck of of um, the UN Security Council, which has implications on Africa beyond just the ICC. Mm. Which African leaders, I think, in my humble view, should be able to to see how they push because they have a whole continent locked out of the Security Council. But also two. The other challenge is African countries like Ban Ki-moon did opine, and I agree with, uh, with his view, should possibly be pushing for a reform of the ICC from within rather mm. than a withdrawal. Because and, 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 and I thought, just uh, yeah. before bringing the other guys, yes. I thought by deciding to bring in Fatou Ben Soda mm. as uh, chief prosecutor, dropping Moreno Campo, the ICC was trying to placate. Um, and then they, and the, the Insecurity Council was trying to placate um, the discomforted. African leaders. But, but let me move to the discussion. Yes. Yeah, um, Honor, you, you stand here at the swearing-in ceremony, President Yerim Seveni. Mm -hmm. You attack the ICC as a useless body. Yeah, because he called it useless. Um, got the leaders, uh, I mean the diplomats of uh, the UK and the United States very uncomfortable. And then you go to the, uh, to the African Union summit just a few days ago. And you're trying to lobby on the sidelines that you want a Ugandan judge to sit on the ICC, on the, on the ICC bench. Well, <coughs> well, I don't see a major contradiction because the, to, to me the ICC 
is really sort of a necessary evil in world diplomacy. I mean, many countries, uh, let's say African countries, know that if the big powers are not taking ICC seriously, so we can afford to say anything about it. But at the same time, it's a kind of uh, uh, once in a while, it makes you feel good. It's more like an NGO of uh, human rights activists, one of those things where you are seen to be in the right crowd at a certain point. But if it irritates you, you can afford to dismiss it. And that's what most leaders are, are doing about it. Of course, the push to withdraw from the ICC is typical of that feeling, the irritation, and knowing that there's really no serious sanction you can get if the Americans are not taking it seriously. Mm. I don't know the position of the Russians and the other big players. So the ICC is, is, is not one of those big areas where you feel you are likely to lose aid or something if you say nasty things about it or, or pull out of it. Mm. So, um, uh, yes. Angelo, who, who's caught in the ICC if the major powers are not even members? Because I think um, the United States is not a member of the International Criminal Court, did not mm. assent to the, uh, to the Rome Statute. Um, Russia is not, uh, did not sign up to the... Uh, China is not. China is not. But the UK is. Uh, the UK is. So you are left with out of uh, the five members of the Security Council, permanent members of the Security Council, only, uh, only two. Yeah, but your question is whether Uganda was doing double speak with yes. regard to, to the ICC. First of all, you know my position. Like 2003, when the Kony case was being referred, at the time the court was just studying, I objected to it. I didn't think that a court of that standing would serve uh, our long-term interest. Since then, actually, one time I sat in a, uh, in a briefing after uh, Moreno Campo left the, the court, and he was speaking to students and faculty. And this is his view of the ICC. He said <coughs> that the West, meaning the Western powers, mm. uh, should preserve the ICC as an instrument, um, uh, a necessary constellation within the Western institutions, an important is instrument of um, uh, extending Western values and Western uh, interests. Mm. That is the prosecutor's uh, own words. That's Moreno Campo yeah. or Brentsona? Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I think oh, Moreno Campo. Mm. And I took notes, I remember. And I think. And I, 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 I was uh, agag <laughs> at how honest he was. Okay, the there were there were rules about this, and I'm breaking them now mm -hmm. uh, about uh, about that that revelation. But the the African governments did not misread the ICC. It's biases by design. And if you ask me, uh, Uganda's initial response to it is consistent. Actually, I have you know Uganda's unpublished foreign policy review here. Mm -hmm. I was reading it before I came. Uh, one of the uh, constituent parts of uh, the foreign policy thinking of Uganda is that essentially uh, the, first, the most vital uh, foreign policy interest of the state is survival. The state has to survive. Mm -hmm. And the ICC, by indicting African leaders, given the way African states are constituted, threaten that survival. So if you, if you go for... Does uh, it? Of course it does. How? How does it? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. If you indict a leader like Yoram Seveni, just now, look at, look at the way Uganda is, uh, the, the, the nature of the personalization of the state in Uganda here. Essentially, you destabilize the state. The state might not survive. Mm. Uh, certainly, this was the thinking with the indictments in, uh, in, in Sudan, in Sudan mm -hmm. and to a lesser extent in Kenya, where the thought was that, uh, again, Moreno Campo, uh, that if you issue these indictments, you can rearrange the politics of Kenya, which they did. And they brought in the so-called government of, uh, so it's of national unity. So some kind of unity. stick by the Western power. E exactly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it reminds me, I love what Chino Achebe said about Africa, and I've quoted it before, that it's neither fatherland, <laughs> nor motherland. It's a childland. I think that's how the Western world sees Africa. Mm. It's a child that needs to be natural. I think the African justice systems are defective. So when you want to sort of approach I'm just, just explaining. The, the, the uh, question I want to put, yeah, what, 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 what do Africans, what do Africans think about the international community? Well, we think, I, I mean, I think do, we do, think do, we are fatherland, that's why we're trying to pull Do you look at Africa as fatherland, motherland, or childland? So here it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're watching from 
mm. our our level here. Certainly, uh, you have to have an interest in whether or not the state as we know it should survive. That's mm. one. Mm? Mm -hmm. Then you appreciate these attacks and the African re the when, when reaction the, of African leaders. When do the leaders fuse themselves with the state and actually use that to threaten mm. the rest of society? Mm. Can we pick that discussion up after a short commercial break? We'll be right back. Looks like Egyptians are celebrating uh, the Africa Cup of Nations finals. Um, uh, I, I, I think, yes, I can see it's, it's uh, 1 0 uh, there. I, I think they've taken the lead. So, um, uh, and uh, earlier today, I, th I, 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 I saw Manchester United thrashing uh, uh, the current champions, uh, Leicester City, 3 1. Uh, I mean, 3 0 um, early in the day. So, maybe we'll try and uh, bring some of those updates. But, gentlemen, the bigger question about Uganda and the International Criminal Court and Africa and the International Criminal Court. There seems to be consensus around the table that the court does not serve a, a justice as its central purpose, but rather serves politics. So the games, the wheeler dealing, and um, uh, the posturing also seems to largely center around the politics, not the justice it's supposed to serve. Yes, I, I, I don't necessarily want to to be part of the conclusion that the ICC does not serve uh, just, but instead serves politics. Because you would now be going into a very complex argument of uh, the law and politics, where you draw the line, and, and, and that conversation is not uh, exclusive to ICC. It's a conversation you can have about um, the judiciary in Uganda, the judiciary in Kenya, the judiciary in any part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, certainly courts and, and, and um, legal systems, for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, the sad reality is serve the interests of the powerful, they serve the interests of the rich, they serve the interests of uh, the connected. Uh, and, and that is, we're not about to reinvent the wheel. So, um, but my, my, my problem is, if the proposition from the ICC, uh, from the African Union, which has now, as of uh, this week, established uh, what they call an open-ended minist uh, African Minister's uh, Committee on ICC, to look into, among others, uh, withdraw as an entity, uh, and other issues concerning African ICC. If the proportion of the likes of Mr. Museveni, Mr. Paul Kagame, Mr. Pierre Nkurunziza, Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, there's just something uh, common about those names, who are the biggest critics against ICC, is that we need a homegrown system. That is a very welcome mm -hmm. argument. We need to be able to grow our own systems um, to try Africans who go against the, the established code of conduct. But the challenge is that is tested. That argument is tested. In uh, about 11 years ago, we established what they call the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And shortly after, they established what they call the Court of Justice of the African Union in pursuance of Article 4 of the African Union Constitutive Act, which says we reject impunity. Mm -hmm. And in the interest of Article 4 of that act, uh, these two courts uh, were supposed to come and, 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 and be... The, the, the stopgap measure against impunity, against injustice, and all these things. The African Court on Human and People's Rights, 11 years down the road, has not significantly done much, mm -hmm. partly because it's poorly financed. But even more scary, out of 54 African countries, only 27 have signed the protocol mm. establishing that court. That essentially means the arguments against ICC are not in principle because the court is prejudiced. And you can have evidence against about it, that prejudice. Does that say some, some, something about Africa and justice? It's just to say that the holders of power and wealth in Africa just do not want justice. Because if they wanted justice, you would not be having only 27 African countries being party uh, or having signed the, the protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Angelo. They would be funding so that for court. For me, before Angelo comes, why, why I'm not a big fan of the ICC? They seem t their concept of justice is always about imprisonment. I have not seen anybody sort of being acquitted. And I'm not even a big fan of imprisonment as a, as a lasting well bringing conflict. They, they actually have. Yes, mm. uh, let's take the case of uh, Omwen, which is really the, the one which is on stage right now for Uganda. There is overwhelming opposition to trial at the ICC within the actual community. And they are so many Owens who are walking, not necessarily free, mm -hmm. but with people's kind of uh, moving on and, uh, and forgiving. So there are other ways in which you can ask specific African conflicts, which are not entirely 
you can't separate crime and other political and social issues yes, that's, in that's some of these war situations. That's true. So if you it's want, to have, let's say in, 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 in the Congo, if you want the lasting solution, taking some of those warlords and putting them in the ICC has not changed but much. Mm. The ICC. Because there are people what, who support what, 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 them. What, what is the option available? The, the spirit. In, in your view, what, what's the option? For I mean, me, I, I'm more for what I, I witnessed in Tesla, for example, where there was an insurgency. A lot of people uh, who are rebels, who are what, have since come back and uh, society moved on. You have, had, that moved you, you have had about mm -hmm. two experiments. One mm -hmm. was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission mm -hmm. of uh, Bishop Desmond, Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, mm -hmm. post apartheid. Mm -hmm. You had um, the Gachacha Court mm -hmm. in Rwanda. You had uh, a Human Rights Commission here doing an investigation in Uganda, mm -hmm. though it never came to much. The question is, why do African leaders react when they think the ICC is coming after them? And uh, f for Uganda, um, uh, and, and I want to draw Angelo into this, you're the first to make a referral to the ICC. Mm -hmm. You have been uh, drumming criticism of the ICC, including the most famous being uh, May 12th, last year when the president was swearing in. You have now, you're pushing to have a candidate on the bench of the International Criminal Court. But where other countries that haven't been as vocal in their criticism have actually taken practical steps like South Africa to notify the ICC of its intention to actually withdraw. Burundi did exactly the same. The Gambia made a threat. I, isn't that the, 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 the epitome of, of double speak? Yes, but I think that is another byword for uh, international diplomacy. There is always um, <laughs> double speak. Mm -hmm. The countries that uh, insisting on very high human rights standards are also the biggest abusers of those uh, very standards. Africa doesn't have the greatest weapons of mass destruction. Have you ever seen the, the biggest conversation about reduction of uh, uh, nuclear weapons is with the people who have those nuclear weapons and who have used them. And my point is that like, it, the, we shouldn't blame Uganda for having an opportunistic foreign policy. And I also think that the reason, the reason why I am, not, I, I am not disregarding the ICC, but I think that I agree with uh, uh, Moreno Campo to, uh, to the extent that the benefit of the ICC is not so much the decisions it makes, but what it stands for. Mm. And African, mm. African views uh, have changed. Remember uh, Moreno Campo's uh, elevation to the ICC prosecutor is because he was the young lawyer who tried the military junta in Argentina. Yes. Uh, and uh, everyone saw that these military people could be put to jail and accountability had. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is not something that the court can do for Africa. The court can certainly set standards, and, but we need to see in Africa, as we've seen with the case of Habre, uh, that uh, ex-leaders will be held to account. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be like uh, this, uh, 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 the former president of uh, the Gambia, uh, Yaya Jame, you know, uh, accommodated in some other African uh, country in the name of uh, mm -hmm. reduction of conflict. If they, but if, 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 they did if, if you use the example of uh, the Gambia, mm -hmm. wouldn't you find African uh, African leaders trying to find solutions? To yes, problems? but he said put why? pressure on the, on on, on Yaya Jame, get him out of uh, the Gambia uh, into the sector of Equatorial Guinea, I think now, and and return some normal to yeah, life instead continues. of instead of you uh, have I would it cause, to I would mm -hmm. cause you took the uh, express the yes, ICC. Yes, yes, but what what's we, the difference? What we what's expect? The what we expect later? I mean, this is a very incre incremental process, is that the cost for people like Jame, uh, or those who aspire to be like the Jame, mm -hmm. eh, is much higher that their behavior when they're in government eh, mm -hmm. is to avoid some of the excesses that happened. And these are, these are things that the court can't do for us. It is because the curve of expectations of African people has changed. And I think that, uh, you know, you look around Africa today, and... The, the, the kind of exercise we, are, we, we, we saw in the last 20 years, I don't think that they're coming back. Well, if, if you look at the people petitioning, uh, for example, for the Kasese situation, uh, uh, trying to make Kasese the, 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 the attack or the palace of the Mumbere in, uh, I mean Mumbere, Charles Wesley, in uh, November last year, mm -hmm. as a situation warranting an investigation by the International Criminal Court, they think that the exercise still do exist and still... Um, in South Sudan? Y yes, if you look at South Sudan. 
if you look at the forgotten Rwanda. conflicts like um, Darfur, which the world has seemed to move on from, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. But the, I, the ICC yes. cannot be a cannot feel the pain more than these Ugandans. You know where the Ugandans lost me. You you cannibalize pensions for young for for old people. Yeah, three hundred billion. You steal it. Okay. Mm -hmm. These very same Ugandans who are saying, oh, you know, Kasese was a, had, had broken a sound barrier. Hmm? Forget that we have a very harsh history of conflict. We are a country of pogroms after pogroms. We had a, in, in northern Uganda here close to 1.8 million people living like worse than cattle in kraals, you know? Let alone the fact that the first person to go to, to be referred to the ICC is a Ugandan called Joseph Kony, whose crimes we can't even speak about. I mean, you, we can talk about how Ugandans cope about with, with this situation, but this is something for Ugandans to deal with internally here. Uh, my, my, my question to Honor is, mm. even with the ICC, do Africans appear like looking for solutions outside without proposing practical ways to deal with some of the issues? You, you, it's okay to push the ICC out, but like um, Ivan said, yeah, ab you have... Absolutely. Yes. I mean, externalizing Africa's problems will not solve them, you know? I don't think referring Konyi and Omwen to ICC was going to to really bring uh, reconciliation or whatever to, <laughs> to Uganda. Because, look, you would either try Konyi here, mm. which would show, of course, courage, but I know political, maybe government <laughs> felt it would be insensitive since now it is adding a lot of support in, in, in the northern Uganda. I don't want to, to sort of again remind him more. But I don't think ICC is going to solve Africa's uh, criminal or justice problem because most of them are political and social. And you need these leaders to either be defeated internally or to be forgiven internally. Mm -hmm. my, my question mm -hmm. is, when you go and stand and mm -hmm. basically posture about your criticism of the ICC, mm -hmm. you need to be equally proposing something that works for you. Yeah, just maybe. Yes. If and I and so, uh, what, what explains the absence but, of that? But of course, if a leader is in power, you can't propose him to hand over himself <laughs> <laughs> to either a local court or whatever. Mm. Maybe you can only say, I, 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 will, "I will resign," you know, but it I don't want to go. I think from that. But otherwise, yeah. it's, it's one difficult. of the biggest ironies is that um, <coughs> the people that are preaching uh, about and against ICC's um, so-called prejudice against Africa and all these places uh, preside over governments um, in. In, in whose countries you have uh, judiciaries that uh, <coughs> are not functioning both in, in form and, and substance in better than the ICC in respect to, to citizens. If you look at, for example, um, a deputy chief justice that, that does the kind of things that uh, Justice uh, Stephen Kavma does. Uh, in Uganda, actually, the, the, the cry about uh, from the, the, the poor, the cry from those in the opposition, uh, is that the, the, the courts don't seem to work for them. The, the courts seem to work for those in power. And, and, and that is just about a question you can, you, you can ask uh, in, in any other African country. So there's already that contradiction, which again feeds into the function of ICC. ICC will not come and try uh, Thomas Coelho if the Ugandan courts are trying him. They only intervene yeah. as they did in Kenya when you have an attempt to, to try people suspected of... Um, fueling violence after 2007 uh, presidential election. And then the Kenyan parliament feels we, ca we, we do not have the capacity to try these people. And then Martha Karua leads the campaign saying, don't be vague, go to the Hague. They will intervene as, as they did in Congo, where the Congolese disagreed mm -hmm. on the basic of establishing a tribunal to try people they suspected of war crimes. They will intervene in countries like uh, Ivory Coast, where in 2003, uh, President uh, Loho Bagbo uh, leads the government that accepts the jurisdiction of the ICC, and then not about 10 years less than, less than 10 years later, he finds himself a victim of, of the ICC. Yeah, yeah, the ICC let's, let's be clear, these are all mm. about interest, right? It's let's let, let's fine, take sure. Congo, that is everyone knows, the most <coughs> unexplored, mm. valuable real estate in the world. We are competitors there, mm. right? Uh, Kenya is East Africa's so-called economic tiger to stabilize it. That's why you had all these uh, high uh, officials in the West <coughs> being part of the conversation about curing Kenya's uh, problem with violence after 2008. Even if in Uganda here we expected that the violence would be the way it was. Mm. 
So those are economic interests. And, and, and I have no problem with that. Have you seen the ICC <coughs> in, uh, in the CAR, you can, for instance? Uh, yes, they did. They mm -hmm. did because what happened in CRR is that the vice president, and then they, they said, you see, the constitution of, of, of the Central African Republic does, uh, does provide immunity for a vice president from, from prosecution. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they were not able to have a successful prosecution, and then the ICC was then invited to intervene. So the ICC intervention has essentially been a, a result of weak systems. Uh -huh. In Africa, you could you could, you could dominate. My my point is that they, that actually, Charles, let these African leaders not really celebrate the so-called shutting the door to the ICC. Mm. Uh, like I said, in the same way, you don't blame Uganda for having an opportunistic foreign policy. Where on the one hand, they reject attempts by the ICC's targeting of uh, African leaders to mess with sovereignty, mm? while proposing a judge mm? Mm. Uh, to the to the to court. The court. Mm? At the same time, do not look as if these leaders have gotten away scot free. The truth of the matter is that our multilateral system in the world has broken <coughs> down. Mm? Look at the failure to resolve the situation in Syria, uh, what's happening right now with Israel and, the and, Palestine. And, 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 and Palestine. Western powers are going back to uh, their default position of acting unilaterally. Mm. And so if there's an African leader today who crosses a certain red line, the fact that he doesn't have the ICC to protect him, you know, is eh, not an advantage. They will come and <coughs> pick you up like they did with Gaddafi. And that won't change. Mm. Ch Charles, yes. my, my concern is between the people and the leaders. To demand for ICC interventions is actually to, is defeatist. Is oh, oh, is defeatist yeah. on whose part? On, on, the, on, on the, the people part or the leaders? Of the people. That's, that's, that's not if, true. Just hold on. If you will cry, those who believe Kazisi was an outrage, was what? and you think the solution is ICC, it means you are incapable of challenging those who perpetrated the atrocities. That could and so long as reality. you don't devolve that yeah. capacity as a people, it's useless to refer to you You're basically saying you know, we should have a scarecrow. You're basically saying we should have a Riek Machar Salva Kiri situation where if, if, no, if, I think if, if you disagree no, with no, no, my I'm saying it's for the sake of the maturity of justice. Isn't it an important scarecrow? For the people against their leaders. I thought uh, that's what I they're supposed to do. I think it's a scarecrow. Gentlemen, we need to take a quick, we, we take a quick break. Uh, uh, you, you, you made reference <coughs> to the Congo and uh, uh, one of the longest serving opposition leaders in that country passed on uh, during the week, Etienne Teshkedi, at um, 84. When he went for treatment in Europe, his office, the, 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 the office of the political party he leads, sent a statement and said, he has not gone to Europe to die, and uh, he didn't come back from Europe. So, um, um, Kavila, but Kavila's God is upset. No, but he, he belonged to that old generation, and I think he was helping 84. to hold. Yes, eighty-four. He yeah. was trying to hold that country a little bit together. Mm -hmm. This negotiation between Kabila and uh, the opposition was largely credits to Etienne Tshisekedi and uh, his uh, his person. So, he, 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 it's everybody's guess what will happen. Whether uh, Moise Katumbi will actually step up to the plate and uh, keep that country a little bit together or uh, I I if Kabila gets the chance to dig in now or how he deals with it and whether yeah. it um, explodes or implodes uh, uh, nobody knows. Let's take a quick commercial break and when we come back we'll be shifting this discussion to neighboring Kenya. We just made reference to Kenya. Uh, there are many things that we can talk about Kenya. One is uh, without maize in Kenya I was traveling uh, along the Movende uh, Kampala road today and the amount of maize being collected and uh, lorries going up to those villages to pick up the maize and take it across to Kenya because they have a crisis there is clearly incredible. And now Kenya is unhappy that Uganda doesn't seem to have supported it up to the end <coughs> in pushing the candidature of uh, uh, Amina, the, the Foreign Affairs Minister, to become the new chairperson of the African Union Commission. We'll be discussing that after the break. You're still watching the fourth estate and we're coming to our last segment where we'll be turning our attention to neighboring Kenya. Uh, which, uh, whose candidate for the African Union Commission lost the rest uh, at the recent African Union Summit. Um, uh, Justin Wabine, I think, watching us from Kabula, the Antwende says, to me, any African country that hasn't ratified the Rome Statute shouldn't do so because the current ICC disposition clearly shows that this is another sort of comprador agent for the Western powers to exert their influence, hegemony, and dominion over seemingly weak but wealthy states. Angel, what is about what do you say to Jose? Well, Jose, it doesn't mean that the um, that influence is, or even the dominion is entirely bad. After all, you know the state is 
uh, a Western uh, model state and some of the values we cherish the most, including accountability uh, values that we have inherited. The idea that you know this is being pushed by the West and it's bad uh, is, 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 is not true. Mm. Uh, certainly people wouldn't give up their, their religion, their language, these race systems. They shouldn't give up the values that uh, are being pushed simply because they're being pushed by Western institutions. Mm. That's why I think, you know, yes, with I, 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 I sympathize with Ona saying that uh, the inability of um, local actors to mobilize, to hold leaders accountable internally mm. is a fault of these uh, of these leaders. I wouldn't go so far, by the way, to, uh, as to blame the victims for being in the situation that they are in, especially if you you know, uh, you, you see the violence against unarmed civilians or, or, or villagers. We can't blame those victims. What we can do, on the other hand, is say that those who have the power, uh, the rest of Ugandan society who are aware, who claim that these values are important to them, they should add their voice. Certainly, like in, in, in Kasese, I, I, I was surprised at the, at the silence of, <laughs> of most Ugandan leaders, mm. outside of government, by the way. Uh, uh, our uh, community leaders, including these ones who have been victims of violence in the past, they didn't speak. Most uh, members of, of parliament, but also civil society leaders, for the ma for the uh, for the for the large part, remained silent. Uh, most people did not want to confront what <coughs> that violence really was. That you know, there was suddenly. Uh, I, 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 I think there were also people yeah. who genuinely felt this was a law and order action by the armed or security forces that they went to arrest the law and order it may and uh, maybe may the events what, what, what was have vindicated that interpretation what, what was evident, because what was evident mm -hmm. or not was mm -hmm. that even in a law and order situation there yeah. was excessive use of force I think mm -hmm. everyone agrees no, but that, but that there were excesses there uh, and, and there does not fit into the pattern because when northern Uganda and part of eastern Uganda was uh, troubled the rest of the country seemed to want to move on. Yes. It, it was I agree. almost like mm -hmm. a foreign story to most of the country. So it follows a pattern that if it falls on the other side, I, I, I used to be shocked um, when there was uh, the 2006, especially 2006 demonstrations and, and a violent crackdown on demonstrations up at Constitution Square. And you'd come down here to around Ginger Road. People are having a blast. People having a blast. At, at the Rouge, is it called the Rouge, uh, Rouge mm -hmm. 9 degrees Rouge, and other places? Yeah. <laughs> yes, people are having a blast. They have no idea that <laughs> heads have been cracked. I do miss that nightclub. <laughs> but that said, you know, it is, it is, it is a, a duty yeah. of... Um, because societies will change with their values if the, the, the larger majority of people subscribe to those values. Okay. And until that time... I, I'm impatient, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. we, we need to move on to... We can tie it into yeah. uh, the discussion about Kenya because... Kenya had both its president and vice president indicted by the International Criminal Court. Mm. And now Kenya wanted to have a candidate, I mean someone lead, uh, a take over the leadership of African the African Union. Union, which officially has taken a position to explore ways on how it redefines its relationship with the International Criminal Court. But the subject to that is uh, the feeling of betrayal held by a lot of Kenyans that Uganda did not support their candidate up to the end. Maybe shortly, um, on, on the, to tie in with the ICC. The ICC is founded on, on, on three principles. One, justice for victims. Two, deterrence of crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, genocide, and, and in printing the added uh, ag uh, aggression. Uh, but also, number three, to ensure that there's respect for, for the laws of war and, and armed conflict when countries uh, disagree and go to war. So I think th those principles are so important for, for all of us, beyond uh, just trying a few people. I think it's important to also deter uh, criminality. With Kenya, I, I did have a talk show yesterday with uh, the Honorable Nusrat Peru, who is mm. an outgoing member of the East African Legislative Assembly. And uh, she was in Addis, in the corridors, uh, as you know, the election was going on. And she gave very interesting uh, information, which the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has, uh, of course, also given. And basically, as a point of clarity, that Uganda did not necessarily disappoint or betray the person of Amina Muhammad, mm -hmm. uh, Cabinet Secretary Foreign Affairs uh, of the Republic of Kenya. 
what actually happened is that the election of the AU African Union, I mean the African Union Commission, uh, Commission chairperson is fairly competitive but also complex. You have about uh, not less than five stages, about six of them. And in, in each of those stages, people get knocked out. Mm -hmm. So in the last and most critical stage, um, I mean, I certainly stood no chance. So the conundrum for Mr. Museveni and uh, Mr. Paul Kagame, who I am reliably informed uh, duly supported her up to the last minute, was in respect to the rule on raising the majority of at least 36 votes, mm. or else we have no chairperson, as happened in Chigali. Okay. What can you lost? Yes. Mm. So Mr. Museveni, to his credit, did the most pragmati uh, pragmatic thing. Uh, he voted Musafaki, who is the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister of Chad, that, that, that uh, is now the uh, elected chairperson of the African Union Commission. Not because it was a betrayal of Amin Muhammad, but because the option was, do you love East Africa so much as to abstain, because 15 countries abstained, so that well, you they deny... They, they, they that group, yes. abstain. Yes, so yes. that you deny Musafaki the majority of 36, and then the election of a chairperson is deferred to the next AU summit. So the president, uh, pragmatically... What would have been wrong with that? Because yeah. we had the AU summit in Chigali, where Uganda was fronting a candidate. Both, all the candidates who were running, did not raise the sufficient number of votes. Because I think the West African bloc then refused to vote, boycotted. Just like Sadak boycotted. What would have been wrong with... Uh, well, on this occasion, you then... Uh, say President Museveni was truly pan-Africanist and actually defeating the the, the, the pettiness the pettiness of the AU and why it's not working anyway if mm. when you have a critical last stage vote sample are still thinking but because we want uh, to defeat West Africa so let's we should have state I mean then how can you elect a chair of a continental body based on block interest then it can't work. Why not? Look, it's uh, politics. Well, the you can sell block interest, but at the same time, you must be able to rise above if you truly believe. Of course, I know most people don't believe. Most presidents don't believe in the AU. Mm. It's just one what, of those what's nice the president, to, what's what's talking <laughs> shop. Let me put the question this way. Was the president <laughs> Museveni being pragmatic, or did he simply switch sides? No, I, I think at the most critical moment, did he switch sides? Well, I can't get mm. into his mind, yeah, but yeah. I imagine, <laughs> look, mm. he mm. might have wanted to be a nice, uh, good neighbor, but he also, at the same time, I think he's, he's, he's not very hostile to Chad, for example. He's friends with Idris Deby. Idris Deby was here not long ago. They, I think they have some, they have fought together in, uh, again, Eskonia and all those kind of dynamics. So, President Zerun was just transitioning to a, a so realistic he, he, he was conflicted. <laughs> he, 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 he wasn't loyal to eight of them. Look, mm. I, I think uh, uh, let's, uh, <coughs> let's stick to what <laughs> the, uh, to, 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 to what the, the written foreign but, but policy just on, I mm. think Kenya mm. and Uganda also is a question of sibling rivalry. This is expected. We always get into all kinds of uh, skirmishes. And I don't know, maybe they thought that because Kazuba was defeated, Uganda was just uh, being a bad loser the, old time, the last time and they wanted to spoil for Kenya also. So when people lose I mean, and they all grow up and being mm -hmm. good losers. <laughs> <laughs> I think when faced with, uh, with what is the national interest, mm. uh, uh, President Europe 7 is clear. Let me tell you, like, my, my field of uh, interest and study and where I consult is the oil and gas sector. As most people know, I disagreed for years, almost 10 years, ab uh, uh, about any desire to put a pipeline through Kenya. I actually wrote an open letter saying that you cannot route both commercial traffic and oil through Kenya. It would create an imbalance mm? in our community. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and, uh, uh, and President Yoram Museveni jointly announced here that you know, the pipeline would go, go through, through Kenya. Through Kenya. Mm. Now I am privy to the process um, through which Yoram Museveni then changed and went to the southern route. And it's not because he had uh, less of an affinity for Kenya or that he was less friendly to Uhuru Kenyatta, but eventually he did realize that the arguments for a southerly route, both the, the, the practical arguments about why that route was good, the cost of it, the feasibility, the as well as the strategic argument, mm. 
all swayed him on one side and despite his commitment you know it was now his job to go and tell his colleague uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta that he would be changing his mind mm -hmm. and up to now that is in, it, it was debated the way it was uh, in now being debated in Kenya you know the, the Ugandans are stabbed us in the back but I think the president was able to take a tough decision mm -hmm. that was <coughs> consistent with the overall national interest at the point that he did. But wouldn't you say that cumulatively the Kenyans have uh, some justification to say these Ugandans are doing, doing us uh, in uh, uh, every moment uh, we have an opportunity, they just take it, snatch it away from us? Uh, they, they would be uncharitable because it, it's not only the AU Commission, which I think at the end would have given Kenya some bragging rights, but there's not much really to get out of the AU. But if you look at what's, what's going on in, 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 in South Sudan, you know, Ugandans are there doing the heavy lifting, eh? mm. and the, the Kenyans for a long time were beneficiaries of the economy that, re, that retained there before the, the conflict. If you look at Somalia, it is again Ugandans who are doing the heavy lifting there, and despite the challenges the Kenyans are, have had, you know, you don't hear Uganda saying, oh, look, uh, we are doing the heavy lifting here, and therefore we should be recognized for this. Mm. I think there are, there are trade offs. Even when you look at the East African economy now, you know, the Kenyans still remain big investors in, 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 in this economy. And <coughs> these benefits are something that the leadership in Kenya can applaud. Mm. It's just that on, at, at, at some point where there is an overlap of these critical interests, you know, we can uh, go our own way. Charles, and I think this really speaks to the bigger story of um, the stop start nature of the East African community towards the East African Federation. I mean, clearly, this latest uh, sort of skirmish between Kenya and Uganda at diplomatic level is not unique. It is, you have always had very petty issues between uh, member states that sort of tend to pull Absolutely. East Africa mm. in the opposite direction. Mm. And while the West Africans seem to always be putting their act together, kicking out uh, leaders and what have you, we keep on getting to this kind of disagreement. But also, Charles, so, so yeah. I, I think the. It was assumed the East African Committee was the most natural union in the whole world, even ahead of the EU, but it looks like it's I, not I, as I, natural. I think there is a further disagreement. Uh, Kenya mm. is still not happy mm. that Uganda and Tanzania are leading the opposition to the EPA, the Economic mm. Partnership Agreement with the European Union. Mm. Because without all the member countries of the East African Community signing up, Kenya cannot benefit. And Kenya and is and the biggest and member. Yeah, because it's, it's Kenya, mm. Rwanda have agreed to sign up. Uganda, Tanzania have refused. Burundi is somewhere neither here nor there, but most likely going to fall to follow the Burundi way. And Sudan is still troubled, uh, is still too troubled to, to have an impact on whether this. Uh, yes, but of course, kind of Uganda and, and Tanzania also have uh, strategic interests uh, on, 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 on the table to consider. Um, and, and of course, one thing about Museveni is that he's not the, the type that will rush into uh, some of these obligations. He, you know, like you said, with the oil uh, industry, it takes its time. You don't want to, to to rush into them. So, if if Kenya and um, and Rwanda want to to speed Uganda into signing obligations that you know those countries, uh, Uganda and Tanzania, feel should possibly be consulted about more, mm -hmm. I think it's only fair to to allow Uganda and, and, and Tanzania have. Uh, the benefit of, of consultation and making a decision that they think is judicious and serves the best of their strategic interests. Mm. But again, on Amina, I think she's not being honest and 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 um, unfair, both to herself, uh, to especially the the, is the consumers of, play, of yeah, Kenyan media, but uh, because uh, from what I was told by Nusra Peru, who was at the AU, the vice the vice chairperson is Kenyan, so there was a misgiving about the chairperson of the commission coming from Kenya. But you also had the gender issue because if she had succeeded, she would be taking over from Dlamin Zuma and uh, some of these African uh, men who have patriarchal mindsets and, and uh, we're raising the question you're of You're being nice not to say these African chauvinists. Yes, mm -hmm. chauvinists. And, but you also have the, the question of... Wouldn't the women <laughs> be saying the same thing? <laughs> but also, man South Africa man. also did support Dlamin uh, <laughs> <Okay>. Zuma. <laughs> Specifically, Uganda was at the forefront or supporting mm -hmm. Lamin Zuma, so part of the misgiving from uh, especially West Africa and, and, and the North was, you know, for the chairpersonship to move from uh, South Africa to East Africa is basically moving from South Africa back to South Africa. You know, with the, with why, the why, why would that argument uh, arise? Because, mm -hmm. just for a moment, 
Why would that argument arise when uh, West Africa has held the chair twice? Hmm. South Africa has held it once. East Africa hasn't held it. North Africa hasn't. Be because I think naturally this would have been a chance either for North Africa or for East Africa. Yeah, sometimes yeah. It's the, those, those, those petty issues will arise. But I think mm. if anybody loves the East African region and, and, and has been shown and demonstrated commitment uh, to the, the, the unity but also the advancement of uh, a better region, I think Amina Muhammad is, is not that person. I think Museveni is that person. So Museveni has demonstrated better commitment to the sort of um, a, a, a better East Africa, a more united East Africa than uh, Amina well, and any crop. Candidate. Museven put up a yes. candidate so to in, uh, in his former vice president. I'm saying, uh, I'm saying that because and, 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 and for, the, mm -hmm. for Amina and, 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 and a section of Kenyans to propagate the, 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 the idea that um, Museven betrayed East Africa and, and specifically Kenya, it's, it's just simply doesn't did hold. She, did she lose by one vote? Uh, no, no, I, I, they went through uh, cycles of yes. voting. Okay. Uh, oh, did, round did one after round five. Did the winner win the uh, two thirds by one vote? No, by no. three. He got 39. So they can't oh, blame okay. only. So they can't blame vote. Uh, uh, so they're blaming so Uganda, so Burundi, what? and. Djibouti. Uganda, Burundi, and uh, Djibouti? Mm. Yes, are uh, the betrayers. She's just being a bad leader. Uh, uh, but, but let me just put this question as we get out of here. Angela, <coughs> does the African Union matter? It does. Certainly as a future institution. But you know, my own personal position has been that the multilateral institutions are not the area of focus for African leaders. It's even much, in, for Uganda particularly, the areas of contention are actually bilateral relationships with its immediate neighbors. Okay. At, the, at the very least, the East African community is, should be the area where our diplomacy should be focused. Kona, does the African Union matter? <laughs> It does not. As it is, it does not. It would matter. It was, look, it is just changed name from the OAU. I know OAU can be credited for the liberation of Africa and what have you, but for now, the critical phase of economic transformation, so to say, of Africa, I don't think the AU is addressing, or it will even have the capacity to address. Because most of the, 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 the talk at the AU is, again, mutual respect and all these. Nobody wants to, do the hard, to tackle the hard issues. Mm. You know, everyone, uh, an assembly of equals, and you, we will get away with the murder, so to say. That's African Union murder. It depends on, 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 on mm. uh, the projection you, you want to look at, uh, the, the significance of the Union. Uh, I think for now, what matters most? Uh, the regional blocks, uh, SADAC, uh, the ESC, uh, ECOWAS, but of course the African Union matters um, in the long term. I, I, do not, I do not subscribe to the notion that uh, we can judge an institution such as that using the now. I think it's also important to look at the now as the building, the, the as the foundation the of, 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 of a better tomorrow. Now. Now. For a continent that's been independent for now about uh, on average 54 years, mm. if and, and, and it's still struggling to look into the future for its institutions to mm. matter, to it, and, and, and it's lost mm. in, uh, in all manner of things. Mm. Uh, uh, for example, the yes, they, they can't elect it. They, they, they have issues electing <laughs> a chair. When they elect a chair, one, uh, I think half the countries don't uh, don't pay their subscription mm. on time, mm. so it's still they heavily dependent on the European Union to fund their own court. Yes, they cannot fund a court. They cannot even the building in which they operate from is a donation from China. You you, you keep asking yourself and say, do these African <laughs> those challenges, those, 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 those challenges, those one of those their former chairs was picked of like a chicken. Those like challenges in the context Western of yeah, those challenges. challenges. You, you haven't found the African mm. Union standing up to any issue that matters to Africa and discuss it with the seriousness that it wants. The, the, uh, that carnage happening in the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. the African Union has been completely silent. And people are drowning every day, and you wait for the African Union, the important people in the African Union, as President Museveni would put it, all those, the excellencies, mm -hmm. to sit and have a discussion about that carnage on the Mediterranean Sea. And you're being lost in a pet the pettiness of electing a chairperson, uh, and, and these fights that you think. But also the concern of the of the gentlemen. Our time is out. We need to get out of here. You have a, a group of desk. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much for making time for the show. Thank you very much, Angela. <laughs> thank you very much, Ona. Thank you very much, um, uh, thank you, Charles. Ivan. Thank you very much to all our viewers for joining us tonight. Apologies to those of you who tried to call us. We're not able to open the phone line tonight.
but we'll be uh, we'll have the phone back on next Sunday. From me, say good night.